Hello. Today I have the next in the series that I've been creating on writing your own expert advisor. So I do have three earlier videos, two are the same. They're basically one for MetaTrader 4 and MetaTrader 5, just showing you how to create the moving average cross expert advisor that I'm using as the example. And then there's a second video, third, depends how you look at it, uh, that shows how to add a condition to check if the market is open before trying to trade. So today I'm taking that expert advisor with those modifications and I'm making some more changes to it. So if you haven't seen the earlier videos, you might want to go back and see those and I'll leave a link in the description for you to find those. But today I'm going to add a trailing stop. So that's the big change for today. I'm going to add trailing stops to this expert advisor and this will be a fixed distance trailing stop. So you just set the size of the trailing stop and it simply follows the price. Uh, I'm also going to change the entries where previously I had the stop loss and take profit entered in points. I'm going to change that to pips just because people seem to be a bit more comfortable talking in pips. Um, and I'll show how to do the conversion from pips to a double value as well. I'm also going to change the take profit and stop loss entry. So you can enter a zero there and then there will be no take profit or stop loss applied. And I'm also going to add to the slow moving average a shift so that if you want to, for example, you could set the fast and the slow moving average to the same values and then simply shift one of those. So you're effectively comparing a moving average to itself from some bars previously. Now, these changes, I'm going to be making them on both MetaTrader 4 and 5 in this one video, because most of the changes are the same. There is just a little bit of a difference in applying the trailing stop simply because MetaTrader 5 uses positions and MetaTrader 4 uses orders. So I will have to write some separate code for those two, but most of this code is going to be the same. And because of that, I'm also going to introduce an include file. And that way I can put the one block of code into the include file, make a change once, and it will get loaded into both the MetaTrader 4 and the MetaTrader 5 versions. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit about how include files work as well, because from some of the comments and conversations I've seen recently, uh, there are people who are perhaps more used to scripting type languages and don't really understand how those include files work here. So I'll give a little bit of a description on that as well as I go through. Now I'm starting, I have the MetaTrader 5 editor open here, and this is the moving average cross exactly as I left it at the end of the last video where I added in the check for market open. Uh, I've just changed the name here to moving average cross with TS and I've changed the folder name. But other than that, this is the same file. And I also have here the MetaTrader 4 file, the same thing. I just have to add in with trailing stop there. And now I said I'd be making changes to some of these inputs. I'm going to be changing these take profit and stop loss from points to pips. And I'm also going to be adding an input here for the trailing stop. And then I'm going to be adding values here to track the trailing stop. That is all identical code between the MetaTrader 4 and the MetaTrader 5. So this is a good point to introduce the include file and I can do all of that code in one place. What I'm going to do is a shortcut. I've got the MA cross with ts.mq4 open. I'm just going to go file save as and change that to MQH. That saves it in the same location. I can do a refresh. And now I have the MQ4 file and the MQH, which just happens at the moment to be the same because I've just done that save as. I'll just change that to MQH. And the first thing I'm going to put into the MQH file will be all of these inputs. So I'll just leave those there, come down to the end here just before on in it and delete the rest of that. Then if I come back to the MQ4 file, I'll add an include statement. And the syntax for this is hash include quotation marks MA cross with ts.mqh. So the quotation marks say that I'm using a relative location for this file. And because I haven't got any backslashes or dots to change the path, it's looking for this file in the same location as the MQ4 file. And MQH is really just a convention. You could use something else if you want to, but it's probably best to stick with the convention of MQH for the include files. Now a brief description of what happens with this include file. When you compile this MQ4 file, and I'll make the same change to the MQ5 in a moment, it simply processes from top to bottom. It reaches this include statement, 
loads that file in and then treats the compile as though all of the contents of that file is actually at this location. If I happen to include the same file more than once, it will only be loaded once. So if I put this include statement again immediately afterwards, the second time I see that include file, it would be ignored by the compiler. So you don't need to worry too much about checking to see whether the file has already been, been included. Now that sequence of including files, particularly when you've got a, a heavily nested structure of include files, it can get a bit confusing and maybe in the future I'll do a, a video on that but you just need to watch and know the sequence that files are being loaded. In this case, it's fairly simple. I've got this one include file and that include file has all of these input statements. So I need to remove them from here. Otherwise I would have the input statements happening more than once and I would get a compiler error. And I also remove those, double, those global variables because I've included those in the include file. So at that point, I should be able to compile this with no errors, yes. I'll go to the MQ5 version and I'll make that same change. So the include statement and then I remove all of these inputs. And just before I finish removing the inputs, you'll notice that in the MQ5 version, I had a ulong for the magic number, and this is an int in the MQ4 version. I can happily use an int here for MQ5 as well, because I'm only using a six digit number. And now I should also be able to compile this. Yes. So now the MQ4 and the MQ5 are using the same include file. Let me just do a refresh on this. So there's the MQH file being used by both of them. Um, I'll also mention, just in case you're wondering, I have done some configuration on my MetaTrader 4 and MetaTrader 5 installations so that they're both sharing the same location for files. And that's why you can see my MQ4 and the MQ5 files in the same place. But I do need to use the MQ5 editor on the MQ5 files and the MQ4 editor on the MQ4 files. Uh, firstly, to get the syntax highlighting correct. But secondly, they won't properly compile each other. Back to the MetaTrader 4 editor, because this is where I've opened the MQH file. The first change I want to make in here, I said that I would be adding a shift to the slow moving average. And I've already written these pieces of code just to make sure I don't make mistakes. So I'll just paste that in here. And that's an integer because it's just a number of bars. So the INP slow MA shift and the default for that is zero. In the next change, I said that I was going to be changing this take profit and stop loss from points to pips. And that also means that they'll be changing to doubles instead of integers. And I'm also going to be adding the input for the trailing stop pips. Just as before, I've written this elsewhere so that I can copy it in and make sure I don't make any mistakes. So I have the INP take profit pips, stop loss pips and trailing stop pips. And I've also changed the defaults here. They were 20 points before. Now I've made them 100 pips. Uh, I found that 20 points when I was doing demonstrations of it was far too small. Uh, but my trailing stop is 20 pips and the take profit and stop loss are 100 pips. We'll see how I do the conversion a little later and I'll explain a bit more about the pips and points then. Uh, there's no change in the magic number. This is just a number that I'm picking out for the demonstration. I'm going to make a small change though to the trade comment. Uh, I'm just changing this to with TS. And then the final change in this block of code, I've already got double values for take profit and stop loss because I'm going to be converting this pips to a double value, but I need one now for the trailing stop as well. And so that's just double trailing stop and that should have a semicolon. And now while I'm in the MQH file, I have these inputs in pips, which I want to convert to a double. I know the values are already double, but I'm saying I'm going to convert pips to a price type value. Again, I'm just going to paste this in and then explain it. So I have two functions. Actually, looks like I've got four, but they're the same function just with defaults. Uh, so the pip size tells me how big a pip is. 
Now you may have your own definition of how you want to calculate a pip, but for my purposes, I'm saying that if the number of digits for the symbol is an odd number, then a pip is 10 points. So if you've got a three digit symbol like a Japanese yen, then I'm saying that a point would be 0 0.001 and a pip would be 0 0.01. And if you've got a five digit currency, then a pip would be the fourth digit. So to do that, I get the value of a point. So the double point equals symbol info double for the passed in symbol. Here is the argument for symbol and symbol underscore point. So that gives me the size of a point, which for yen would be 0 0.001, for euros would be 0 0.00001. I'm getting the number of digits with symbol info integer, again, the symbol, but this time symbol underscore digits. And I'm actually casting that to an integer. I know this says symbol info integer, but it actually returns a long. So I'm casting that to an integer. And then I just have this digits percent two, this is the modulo operator. So if digits percent two is equal to one, meaning I've basically got a remainder of one when I divide digits by two, then point by 10. And if this is an even number, then that would be a zero. And so it's just point. Now, some people may prefer, and as I mentioned, you might have your own method of converting to pips. Uh, some prefer to simply test to see if number of digits is three or five. I'm going one step further and saying if the number of digits is one, although I've never actually seen a symbol with one decimal place. But uh, in that case, pips will be 10 points for anything that has an odd number of digits. The reason I have this other function here, same name, pip size, but this has no argument. And then I simply do a return pip size for the chart symbol. So it's just a shorthand way of having the pip size that is either based on a passed in symbol or the chart symbol. And in case you're wondering why I don't simply say string symbol equals symbol as a default value, this symbol you'll see has the double brackets here. This is a function and default values in functions must be constants. So they can't be function results themselves. Once I have the size of a pip, I use that then in the pips to double function. I've again had the same function name twice, but one of these is simply with number of pips and the other is pips and a symbol. So this first one simply passes in the chart symbol as the default. But all I need to do to convert a number of pips to a double value is pips multiplied by the size of pips for that symbol. Also, while I'm here in the include file, the isMarketOpen function, and this is from the previous video, so I won't be explaining how this works. I can put this into the include file. So I've just done a paste of that. And if you remember from the last video, I had two versions. There was isMarketOpen and isMarketOpen2. This is actually the isMarketOpen2, the more efficient version. And I'm just going to add two more functions, just as I've done here with the pips to double and the pip size. I'm going to add two more variations of isMarketOpen that set the defaults for the symbol and the time. So the first takes no arguments and it's going to return is market open for the chart symbol and the current time, which is the most common use. And the second just accepts a time and returns is market open for the chart symbol and that time. And then just one more thing that I'm going to move into this include file, and that's the is market open function, which I've also described before, because that is common also for MetaTrader 4 and 5. And now I have to remove those same functions from the MQ4 and also from the MQ5 file, because if I just compile this now, I'll get errors, is new bar, function already exists because it's in two places. So it gets to this include, loads that file, compiles the function, and then finds the same function name already in this file. So I'm just going to clean those up. I'm removing the points to double function because it's no longer used, and the is new bar function. And in the MQ5 file, I can remove points to double, is new bar, and the is market open as, and also the is market open two, which is actually the one that I've copied into the include file. So now I've removed those functions, but I should still get errors on this points to double. 
because the point to double function no longer exists. Now pips to double and I don't have these inputs. That's a quick fix. I just take profit, stop loss, and now I've added the line for trailing stop. And these are all calling the new pips to double function with the inputs for the pips. And that compiles. I won't do the same on MetaTrader 5 yet, um, or at least I won't try the compile because there is more code further down in the MetaTrader 5 version. But I will make this change to MetaTrader 5. So MetaTrader 5, I've now done the same thing. Take profit, stop loss, trailing stop, and they're all pips to double. While I'm here in MetaTrader 5, I have introduced a shift to the slow moving average. There is an argument in the IMA function that allows me to set a shift, but I'm not going to use it. I'm actually going to apply the shift when I pull values out from the moving average. But if you want to, you could put the shift here. It's just my choice that I'm preferring not to use that. Uh, and it's this value here. If you can see the help there, this is the MA shift. I'm not using it. I'm going to leave that as a shift of zero. I just prefer to adjust the bar number that I get the value for. You may prefer to use the shift here. We'll just stay in MetaTrader 5. You can see that I have the call to is market open to. I'll change that back to is market open because that's the name of the function that we've put into the include file. And here in the copy buffer statement is where I'm going to be applying that shift. So the arguments to this, the slow handle, the buffer number, starting position and number of bars to copy. So I'm still copying three bars, but I'm just going to put the shift in here as the starting position. To make the same change in MetaTrader 4, close up this compile results, need to scroll this to the right, but for these two values, the slow one and slow two that I'm getting, I just need to add the shift to the bar number. So I'm getting those back for bar number one and two. I just need to add the shift to those. And I think now this will compile, no errors. And I think by this stage, the MQ5 will also compile. Yes, it does. So all of that is consistent now. I've made the change to allow a shift for the slow moving average. I've changed the inputs from points to pips. And we now have a value that we can use for the trailing stop. The last thing to do here is to actually apply that trailing stop. So still in the MetaTrader 5 editor, let me close that. I want to check for the trailing stop on every tick, not just once per bar. Now that could be a choice you might prefer to only check once per bar, but I'm going to put my check for the, or my update for the trailing stop in here, where it's ahead of this check for is new bar. If you want to only do this once per bar, then you can put the trailing stop test here after the is new bar. Now I still have it after the checks for is market open because if the market's not open and if trading's not allowed, I still can't apply any trailing stops. So I still place it here, but I've just put it before the is new bar check. And I'll do the same in MetaTrader 4. It's exactly the same statement and it goes in the same place. So they're just before the is new bar test. Close that as well. So apply trailing stop, obviously this is a custom function that I've written. So I'm going to jump down now to the bottom of the code and put the apply trailing stop. And because of the difference where MetaTrader 5 uses positions and MetaTrader 4 uses orders, I actually have a different copy of this for MetaTrader 4 and 5, but the structure is almost the same. So I've gone back to MetaTrader 5. I'll do it here first, and then I'll go to MetaTrader 4, put the same code in or the matching code for MetaTrader 4, and it'll make the explanation a little simpler there. So here's the apply trailing stop function. First, I'm grabbing the ask and the bid prices for the current symbol, simply with the symbol info double for symbol and symbol ask or symbol bid. And that's because the trailing stop for buy and sell are based on different values. The buy trailing stop price is ask minus the trailing stop amount. That's that variable that we set up at the beginning in the init section. And the sell trailing stop price is the bid plus the trailing stop. So that's calculating one time only where those trailing stops are going to be because I'm using a fixed size trailing stop. So it doesn't matter which order I reach or which trade I reach, it's going to be at that same price if I set the trailing stop. And then I'm just setting up this int er. I'm capturing the error in case I get a failure somewhere just so that I can display it for you. 
Now this code is for hedging accounts, not for netting accounts, because I'm looking at individual positions. And I've also got an earlier video noted here, and I'll put the link in the description as well, where I show how I loop through in reverse and why I do that. One important thing to note though, positions total will return a uint, but I'm using int here. If I use a uint, then this will fail or will go into a rather long loop, uh, simply because if there are no positions, so positions total returns a zero, I'm beginning at positions total minus one. If I set i to a uint, then I can't go negative, I can't go to minus one. So this actually wraps around and becomes the maximum value of a uint. And of course, then the loop begins and I simply skip around this millions of times uh, until i is zero, which is not what I want. So by setting this to an int, if positions total is actually zero, then this will start at minus one and terminate the loop immediately. So for MetaTrader 5, positions total tells me how many total positions I have across the entire portfolio for this account, not just for this symbol. I get the ticket number for the position at position number i, with the position get ticket passing in the index of i. If position select by ticket for that ticket number fails, then I continue, which will simply go back to the next iteration of this loop. If for some reason this position get ticket fails, then I'll get zero in the ticket number, which will cause this to fail. So that's why I'm not bothering to test the ticket. I'm going straight into the position select by ticket with the ticket number and any failure there will cause me to just go to the next iteration. And now there's something that I did forget to mention and I'll just have to scroll back to the top of the MQ5 code. Here we go. Uh, I've included trade slash trade.mqh because for MetaTrader 5, the trade object, the Ctrade class, uh, provides a number of functions that make trading easier than writing all the code myself. By including this file, it in turn includes more files, and one of those gives me access to a class called C position info. And I'm going to use that in the same way as I use trade because it makes working with positions easier. So I'm declaring C position info position. Let's go back down to the bottom of the code. And you can see here what I have is position.symbol. So that gives me the symbol for the currently selected position. If position.symbol is not equal to the chart symbol or position.magic, which is the magic number for the currently selected position, is not equal to the input magic number, continue. Because remember, this is going to find every position, not just positions for this chart or this expert advisor. So I want to skip anything that is not meant for this expert. The first test, if position.position .position type is by and now this goes quite a long way. I probably should wrap this around. In fact, I will. If this is a buy position and the buy trailing stop price is greater than the price open for the position. So I'm only applying the trailing stop if that trailing stop is better than the open price. So I'm not going to be applying it if it's a losing price. But then I also need to say if position.stopLoss is equal to zero, as in there is no stop loss currently set for this position, or the buy trailing stop price is greater than the position stop loss. So I only want to adjust the stop loss if the current or the new value, this buy trailing stop price, is better than the existing stop loss price. And that, if I can just get the highlighting to go, that is one statement. I'll just add another space there, maybe that makes it easier. So that's one condition. It's important to include this position.stoploss equals zero as well, because that means I haven't set a stop loss, so I'm free to set one based on the trailing stop. So with all of this, I'm saying it's a buy trade and the buy trailing stop price is better than the open price. And I either do not already have a stop loss or the trailing stop price is better than the current stop loss price. Because the trailing stop is nothing more than adjusting the stop loss on the position. Uh, I'm just calling reset last error in case I do get a problem. And then I'm using the trade object, 
which you would have seen in the very first video on this series, dot position modify, ticket number, the buy trailing stop price is the new stop loss, and the existing position dot take profit is the take profit value that gets passed into this function. I'm saying if not that, so this will return a boolean. If it fails, so if not, then I grab the error number with the get last error function and I print fail to update the trailing stop on ticket percent %i64u. So this particular format says that I've got an unsigned value and it's a 64-bit integer to percent %f, which is a floating point placeholder, error equals percent %i, which is an integer. And then I just feed in the values ticket, buy trailing stop price, and err. In case the position I picked up was a sell position, I've got almost the same code, but this time position type equals sell, and I've reversed the signs on the conditions. And let me wrap this around as well for you. In this case, if the sell trailing stop price is less than the price open, because we're selling, so that's better. And the same condition here, stop loss is equal to zero, or the sell trailing stop price is less than the existing stop loss. And space there again. And then this code is the same. Trade.position modify sell trailing stop price here. So that's the complete apply trailing stop function. Let me just make sure I can compile this. And I can. Now let's go over and do the same thing for MetaTrader 4. The sequence of the events here are the same. I've just got some different functions to call to get values. So down at the bottom of the code again, I'm just going to paste it in and then quickly explain this because it's all the same code basically as MetaTrader 5. I don't need to get the ask and the bid price in variables here because they exist in MetaTrader 4 already, ask and bid, uppercase A for ask and uppercase B for bid. I'm doing the same loop, but in this case I'm using orders total for int i equals orders total minus one. In MetaTrader 4, I just call order select with that index, select by position, and mode trades. I don't need to grab the ticket first. Uh, but this does the same thing as the position select by ticket for MetaTrader 5, and then continue if that fails. Same test here. If the order symbol is not equal to symbol, or the order magic number is not equal to the input magic number, continue. That loops back. And then for the buy trade, if the order type is buy, and the buy trailing stop is greater than the order open price and I should wrap this one around as well. And the same things here, order stop loss is equal to zero or the buy trailing stop price is greater than the current stop loss price. Uh, and then this is the same, reset last error. There is no trade object here, so I'm just calling, if not order modify, the ticket number, order ticket, the open price, order open price, new trailing stop or the new stop loss price, order take profit, and order expiration. Now, there are different arguments here, obviously, to the MetaTrader 5 version. This is simply a different function, and it takes different values. Order ticket is obviously what the order modify needs to know to be able to modify this order. I can't change the open price, but the same function is used if I'm modifying something like a buy stop or a buy limit, uh, where you can actually change the open price. But this is ignored if you call order modify on an existing market order or market trade. Stop loss price, take profit price. I'm pulling in the order take profit there. And order expiration also, in case I'm using this to modify a stop or limit order, but it gets ignored for the modify on market orders. And then the same print format, just with different placeholders. Here it's an integer for the ticket number, floating point, and an integer for the error. And then of course the cell is the same thing in reverse. I'll wrap this around again. And that's it. And now something I almost forgot. I said that I would uh, allow you to enter zero as the take profit or stop loss number to avoid actually creating a take profit or stop loss. And that's a very simple thing. I'm just gonna put that in here. Sorry, I almost missed that. So at this point, after I've calculated the price, the stop loss and the take profit, I've just inserted these two lines. If stop loss equals zero, SL equals zero. And if the take profit value is equal to zero, 
then the TP equals zero. I could have saved a little bit of computing if I had put conditions here higher in the code to say don't bother calculating the stop loss and the take profit prices, but it just makes the code look a little neater by entering the code here. And really this is not gonna happen very often. This happens once per bar, so I don't have too much of a problem with going through the calculations and then simply resetting the SL and the TP values to zero. And just by setting those to zero, they get passed into the function here and a zero value means no stop loss or no take profit. I'll just go to the MT5 version. And I can put the same lines in the same place. So after the final calculations of price, SL and TP, I simply reset the SL and the TP to zero if the original entries for stop loss and take profit are zero. Compile that to make sure I don't have an error. I don't and do the same on the MT4. So this code will be available for download. Um, I'll put a link in the description so you can find that. I think it'll probably be linked through our web page. So you go to the web page and then we'll have a link to the download. It's just easier for me to maintain if there are any changes in the location for the file that way. But that is a brief introduction to using include files and how to apply a trailing stop on your orders. Hope this has been useful to you. If it has, please click the like button. And if you want to see more of our videos, click subscribe and then click the bell icon to get a notification when we release new videos. So until next time, thank you for watching.